Welcome to All Home Care Matters, the show where we discuss all things home care with discussions on important age-related matters and topics. Brought to you by Enriched Life Home Care Services, the number one rated home care provider in Michigan by top rated local. Hello, and welcome back to All Home Care Matters. If this is your first time joining us here at the show, we want to say thank you for taking time out to be with us today. We appreciate how valuable everyone's time is, and that's why we try and make each episode here at All Home Care Matters something that hopefully matters to you. Today, we are welcoming a very special guest, the co-founder of Ponga, Barbara Tian. Thank you so much for being here, Barbara. Thank you so much. It's a pleasure to be here. It's a, it's a real honor. Oh, thank you for being here. So, Barbara, tell us, what is Ponga? Ponga is software that gives you an ability to take your family pictures, your treasured digital photographs and, and uh, artifacts, and share them with, organize them quickly and simply so that you can use them to tell stories. We think of them as a vehicle to uh, put old stories back into circulation in the same way you sit down and let me tell you about what this, what was happening right here. Pictures are special that way. So Ponga is a really neat name. It's a fun name. Is there a story behind the name oh, Ponga? Absolutely. You know, there's a story behind everything. Uh, Ponga comes from the Spanish word poner, which means to put and is in the form of, uh, you know, put it right here. And we thought that was so appropriate, particularly in regard to a uh, something on one hand that's digital, but also where we're talking about a digital artifact as a way to capture the physical world around us. You want to put things into a picture. So that's the put. As it turns out, again, a wonderful word that's so simple and short and fun to say has many meanings across many languages. It turns out that the word ponga also is used in the Maori language of the South Pacific, particularly the area around uh, New Zealand. Um, and it's the name of a kind of indigenous tree fern called the ponga weki. And it happens that that is the tree fern that is the, the silver tree fern that is sacred in the Maori culture. Uh, you see it in the ferns, um, black fur, the, the blacks, the, it's called a, a, a rugby team, I think, or a soccer team out of New Zealand. Um, and a lot of these kinds of imageries that we see in uh, the, the, the whole Maori culture. So it's very symbolic, very symbolic. Now, when a family or individuals are using Ponga and they're trying to create these stories and these connections, how do the shared stories form that connectivity tissue, if you will, with families? You know, it's funny. Um, it's often said that uh, uh, stories just form the, it's like the applications in the mind. We can have lots of memories flying around, but until you put them into a narrative, you can't hold them together and, and keep them together. So it is so common as a way to establish a relationship, to establish a commonality. And let me tell you a story about what brings us together. And in a family where you have many generations that might have lived apart or generations whom you never met, you connect with them in pictures. So we found it really interesting to find a way to put the story, the narrative part that strings together the, the obvious facts in a picture with a narrative that tells a story and suddenly it has deeper meaning. So, um, you know, it turns out that it's not really about pictures. It's about what you can't see in a picture. So for example, who is this? Who are these people? Why are they there? What was happening? Why is this picture important? Why was it in a silver frame on grandma's desk? So you start putting these pieces together and now you understand the larger context. And I think as we talk about our elders, this is especially true. And, you know, we don't think about it often, but photography is a technology. It's just a 200 year old technology. And 200 years is very recent in the arc of human existence. Um, and our elders, our, my, my own parents are in their 90s, for example, their grandparents were born in the middle of the 19th century and were some of the very first generations to ever be photographed. 
And when you think about that kind of a connection of just two generations is pretty remarkable in being able to have stories that can be carried forward. And it pains us to see any of these stories lost. So how does Pongo work to connect these stories and to capture that legacy? Sure. Well, fundamentally, Pongo runs in a browser. So it's, it's in the cloud, it's internet stuff. Um, you take your photographs and upload them into Ponga. And uh, we have the concept of members. It's a subscription service. So we have members who pay us for this private service. They can upload their pictures, as many pictures as they like. And we use magic of uh, face detection and collection technologies, artificial intelligence, computer vision, fancy blah, blah, blah stuff applied in a very personal, private way. We go through, collect the pictures, organize them for you by face. We don't know who these people are, but you do. So we'll take all the pictures of uh, a given person. We can tell it's the same person with a pretty high level of confidence. And then we put it in front of you and say, do you know who this person is? You might say, hmm, I'm not sure. We'll show you the best, clearest picture we have of their face and say, basically, how about now? That can be really helpful to context. And maybe that picture is titled Aunt Mary at graduation. Oh, I think that's Aunt Mary. <laughs> um, and then you put a label on. And now all of the pictures that you uploaded that included that person's face, Aunt Mary, are now filed in an album called Aunt Mary. And every picture you look at will have her face labeled. And you do that a few more times and pretty soon you've captured all of your aunts, all of your cousins, all of your uncles and people you know immediately. And then you look at every picture and you can see who everybody is. And you know what, really quickly, that leads you to the question of why were they all dressed up? Why was he not dressed up? What was happening? What's that building? It keeps appearing in all these pictures. And that guy, he's in all these pictures and I don't know who he is. So those kinds of things become the, 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 little, the little nuggets of mystery, the things that make these artifacts so interesting. And uh, from our perspective, that interesting part is the gold. That's the thread you follow. That becomes the arc of the narrative. That becomes the germ that gets people interested. And we just love the idea of getting intergenerational conversations happening. So because those conversations are the trigger, are the bond that hold a family together. Just out of curiosity, if let's say um, a child had, you know, their mother and their father, and after their parents had passed away, they go to clean out the house and they find a box of all these photos. One set of photos is from the dad's side of the family. The other set of photos is from the mother's side of the family. And relatives on the dad's side and relatives on the mother's side are on Ponga and they've established their stories and their connections and everything. And that child decided, okay, I'm going to join Ponga and I want to really find out about these photos because there's really very little information. Would there ever be a way since one family may have already identified those faces that if those faces appeared in those pictures that you, that person would be notified? Is there like a cross reference? Um. Or there's all kinds of really interesting things that we know will be really interesting to do um, at a meta level as we keep going on this journey with Ponga. We're a very new startup. So we just started in uh, a couple of months ago as a product. Um, so yes, we do think that's super interesting too. Right now, one of the really important concepts, I described uploading your own pictures and sharing them. You described a story, which by the way, is usually those pictures are all lumped together and not so delicately organized. <laughs> but one of the biggest things that happens when someone does pass and you have these artifacts that you don't have the history on is that they are individual pictures, individual artifacts, and there's lots of people who want them. So going out and getting them scanned is one of the most important things to do, both from a backup perspective, but also from a, as a means to share them without the cost of duplicating the artifacts, the, the physical artifacts. And of course, out here in California, uh, our fires are a very real risk. And so there's always that what's going to happen to my, my, my precious one-of-a-kind items in the event of a fire. So uh, getting them duplicate, getting them scanned, and then once scanned, our members, 
not only can go through and identify, but they can also share the pictures with as many guests as they like for free. Their guests are always free, 15, 1500, we frankly don't care. It's perfectly fine with us because they then have the ability to determine if their guest has what access level. So they might decide that, you know, these 15 people can add as many comments as they like, but the other 500 are just here to view. In fact, we have one of our members um, has just made an album that she's especially a proud of in terms of what she's done and how she's done it. And she's made it available to anybody that just asks. So if you go to tips.ponga.com, our blog, uh, the, I think it's the, the it's, it's called Ponga Porting. Um, she talked about transporting a uh, photo album into a Ponga album. And then she invites anybody from the public to just ask for an invitation. She doesn't have you write all over it, but you are welcome to come in and explore it. And all you do is drop your email and she'll send it to you. Wow. Um, so from that perspective, you have that flexibility to invite anyone. And by the way, in the genealogy space and family history, there are all, I mean, it's one of the key reasons people join things like ancestry and my heritage and so on is because they're trying to bait cousins they don't know or part of DNA circles that we all share this, this triple great grandfather and I don't know any of you people. Who are you? So how do I find it? So I post something somewhere and say, hey, if you're interested, come contact me. Um, it's always a little delicate dance. You know, it's like Craigslist and <laughs> selling something. You don't know these people. Who are you? But it, there's, there's, you know, a, frankly, storytelling is part of establishing trust, establishing that connection. And when people can share memories, you know, um, uh, that's a that's a great way to share that kind of trust artifacts. You know, I have I have the brooch your grandmother's wearing in that picture because it was passed to me by my great aunt who was your grandmother's whatever. <laughs> yeah, no, I think that's amazing. Well, you know, um, we take a lot of photos of our family, you know, of our kids and you know family events, and that's always one of the concerns on my mind is. How do we ensure that these are not going to ever get lost? Because like you said, stuff like that, you can't just replace. There's not, let's go back to the store and, or, you know, you can't retake a one-year-old birthday party photo when the child's now nine years old, you know? So, I mean, I think it's critical that people have that ability to protect those memories and dealing in the field that we deal with and, you know, seeing so many families with loved ones who have, you know, dementia, Alzheimer's or any number of long-term care issues, being able to tell those stories and capture those memories or even just getting information, grandma, mom, who was that in that photo? Um, eventually you run out of people you can ask, you know, and so being able to capture that, I think is important. Have you had any stories like that, Barbara, where a family has said, wow, you know, this has helped me to, you know, get an answer I've never been able to get or. Yeah. Well, you know, um, uh, a lot of these kinds of things, we actually call them tingle moments, you know, we just internal in the company. Cause we, we know when you just hit that nerve and we feel like it's a, it's a special responsibility given what we're doing in our business um, to be very careful and very private with those. And in fact, it's just like, you know, the fear of fire is the fear of loss or even worse, the loss of control of those pictures. So things like putting pictures into Facebook um, or giving them to people who didn't know any better and took these adorable pictures of children in the bathtub and posted them to Facebook. I mean, people don't always understand what the consequences are, what they're doing. So this kind of thing is, is about control of those pictures. And getting back to your point about um, having those special moments and moments of loss, all of us as founders, there's four of us co-founders as Ponga, um, all of us have gone through these kinds of special moments, either with our own families directly or with our specifically with our parents. Um, uh, I am very lucky to still have both of my parents alive. Uh, they're in their 90s. They're both doing very, very well. Um, uh, my mom has suffered from dementia, vascular dementia, which is a very slow moving uh, dementia, as you know. 
Um, and it's been a time to, over the last seven years or so, it's been a time to get to know her on a very different level and to share these kinds of stories. And I have watched quite closely as those stories slip away. And having Ponga as this idea at first and as a platform in development, um, it's been a privilege to be able to share with these. And she's had enough little nuggets to be able to share. And then as you know, dementia is mysterious as the brain is mysterious. And every now and then the strangest things bubble up. Um, and we can pull from the pictures and I share the pictures. I often use her in my own social media um, because she's tickled. She loves, she loves being the model again. Um, and it's a, it, it's, it's a model in a different sort of way. So yes, each of us have, have been through these kinds of experiences, um, not only uh, specifically those of age, but also traumatic brain injuries um, and other ways to feel how life takes a sudden left turn you never anticipated. And I think all of us, once you reach a certain age in life, um, you know, go through those kinds of experiences, some younger than others, but, um, you know, it's, it's a reality. It's like reaching middle age and you realize middle is a privilege. It's not old, it's a privilege. Right. And uh, the privilege of having an understanding of those who came before you and what their, what their lives, what they saw. And those who are younger and still suddenly coming to grips with what it means to be an adult or coming to grips with what it means to have young children and, and so on, these, these miraculous stages of life. Um, I'm at that point where I'm really starting to appreciate how history intertwines with my own family background. Um, and, you know, whether it was the um, migrations to the United States in the early 19th, uh, 19th century or 20th century to um, the westward migration um, in that same period of time. Because, again, I've mostly studied this period where we have photographs um, and uh, where we have, you know, historical archives and things. It's, it's fascinating. It is very fascinating. And, you know, I... I think somebody had once said, you know, a picture can speak more words than a book can, you know, because you don't know what exactly, if you don't know what exactly the picture is, it could be anything. So you could create your own story and then find out oh, I was totally wrong. And here's the real story. And I, I just think there's a great appreciation for the need for these storytelling and capturing it and keeping it secure and safe. Now, I know when we previously spoke, uh, you were mentioning too that families can also upload video. Is that correct? Well, we're not taking the video directly into Ponga, but um, video is very often, uh, especially for families that have these treasure troves of high eight and you know old movie formats from the 50s and 60s is just incredible. Um, as long as the video is digitized and we have many partners who do the digitizing and accessible on a, a cloud-based link, we can bring it into Punga. So uh, the easiest forms are all these forms that are designed for um, web uh, for web pages. So there's lots of media that are designed to have web you know media uh, video appear on a web page from TikTok to YouTube, and so any of those links, copy paste the link you're in. Um, but we also can have video stored at a at a, simply a cloud storage uh, tool from Google Drive to um, permanent.org, where you can just paste the link in, click it, and it goes to that site and plays the video. Um, having media, I mean, I don't know about your, if you use iMessage on an iPhone, for example, very popular means, the idea of pasting a link into a chat to make a point. Um, and you go ha ha to that thing you just saw from, you know, Instagram or YouTube or TikTok or something. Sure, we're all doing that. We are using memes. We are using GIFs. We are using video. We are using documents to make a point. They're part of the conversation now. Ponga is modern in that regard because you can just as easily do that. But you can also just as easily make a selection and just click a button and tell a story with your voice. It's like having a telephone conversation with someone who might not be there. And in fact, uh, you can also use it with Zoom as we are here and uh, click a button and 
have them record, you just happen to be on the other side of the screen or sitting right next to them to walk through and do that. I have a family visiting right now and I have my uh, brother sitting with his wife, my sister-in-law, looking at the old photos of her mother's um, uh, uh, honeymoon in Havana in the 20s. And the two of them, you know, sharing stories live as they're looking at the pictures, reading from really delightful hand script on the bottom of the cards, you know, finding ways to bring those real artifacts together. And then the context that one generation knows, and then it will be passed down to their children, um, who are all adults now, and their own lives and perspectives and memories from what Nana said, and so on and so forth. It's, again, these are the tingle moments. Yeah. I think that there could be such a useful resource and tool for families caring for loved ones with dementia. Because quite often, um, like in my professional job, we do, you know, memory care programs uh, for these individuals who are, you know, dealing with dementia. And as a consequence, also, we're really providing care for that family, because a lot of them aren't equipped to provide that care, or they would rather be the daughter than the caregiver, you know, um, and then some just aren't comfortable with that personal approach that, that their mother or father or spouse may need. And part of that is, we always tell them, have them go through old photo albums, have them go through photos and, you know, because it's a good stimulation. But, you know, sometimes there comes a point where they're going along through those photos and then there may come that point where they no longer remember what that photo is or what that was about. Like you were saying, what was that building in all these pictures or why was he not dressed up in that picture? But by going through it with them, they could leave on almost like a, um, a digital or an audio record of that photo. So when they're looking at it, they can constantly be reminded of that was uncle Johnny at his baptism or, you know, whatever the case may be. I just think it's such a powerful resource and tool, not only for the, the historical aspect, but also for the a caregiving aspect to help them with their loved ones. Now, speaking of caregiving, we had, um, uh, a, a great conversation uh, a little while back and you were sharing with me that you kind of came into this new role of establishing a family council at the facility your mom was at, which I really thought was fascinating also. Um, and give you a lot of credit and uh, kudos for that because, you know, a lot of these, as you will probably explain here in a moment, a lot of these facilities, you know, the families aren't necessarily always kept in the loop as good as they should be or could be. Um, so you said that you and some other family members, um, different families, but you just occasionally kept crossing paths, decided to establish your own family council. Tell, tell me, tell me about that. Well, it was about as organic as these kinds of things could possibly be. Um, as we've been very uh, fortunate um, in uh, for a bunch of reasons, home care wasn't really an option for us. And when uh, circumstances uh, led us to it, we were very fortunate to find a place that is less than a mile and a half from my house, a walking distance from my house. And so I visit my mom every day. It went pre-COVID and um, uh, would see some of the other, mostly daughters, but family members coming and going. And pretty soon you start to recognize the same people and you chat it up. And we started saying, you know what? You know, it's, it's weird. It's a little like a reverse PTA uh, in the sense of, you know, we want to, we, we all have the shared interest in their well-being, and, and uh, why don't we share what we know and advocate for their benefit together? So this idea, we called ourselves the daughters of, um, then it was the, you know, allies, uh, because we weren't all daughters. And uh, then we discovered um, that, in fact, as an institution, the um, here in California, all of the kinds of things that regulate these uh, kinds of facilities. Uh, in California, it's called the RCFE, is the kind of institutional residential care for the elderly. And within all of of the California statutes for the residential care for the elderly, all of which are managed by the, the same organization that manages uh, Medicare, um, forget the acronym. Um, 
that there is such a thing defined as a family council. And a family council gets certain rights as far as the RCFE regulations are concerned. So we can go to the management and say, we demand a bulletin board. We demand space to have a meeting, <laughs> right? Those things actually sound really quaint, don't they? <laughs> um, and so just knowing there was such a thing, we declared ourselves a family council. We didn't think of that ourselves. Um, and then we had to push kind of hard for things like signage by the front door. And we used the argument about bulletin boards to do that. Because at a certain level, the institution thinks of this a little bit as uh, unionizing, you know? Um, and so it, it took some time. We've been at this for about seven years now. And as you can imagine in an elder care home like this, especially in this case, a memory care, all memory care uh, home, there are not very many residents who have lived there for more than say four years. Um, my mom's been there for seven. I think there's a few over 10. Um, and um, we get to know each other. We get to care for each other. We look out for each other. Um, and this was a way that as much as anything allowed us socially to connect, allowed us socially to do that. Once COVID hit, uh, like you, <laughs> we got we, we got, you know, uh, creative about ways to stay connected. Um, I was, um, you know, it was actually some other families that came to me and said, hey, let's, let's do, can we do this as Zoom calls? We tried pressuring the management to do Zoom calls with us, and they apparently were very anxious about that. It had gone very badly for a sister organization, and they just didn't want to go there. I mean, you know, these are the early days. The sister organization had had a very bad outbreak um, and they were just not prepared to respond to panicky families. So um, we started our regular meetings. We now have a monthly Zoom call with whoever wants to attend. We have a, a forum, we just use Google Groups. Um, and that re produces an email that goes to everybody. If you know the technical term, a listserv, um, one email in goes out to everybody without everybody knowing everybody else's email address, which is great. And uh, we have a website um, and the website is using a free website builder. I've, I get, I get to be the nerd because I'm tech, you know. <laughs> um, and I use the fundamental principle that all of the tools that I use to bring this group together have to be free. Because that way, I mean, it's, it's kind of like a school, but nobody graduates, right? Um, so as people, families come and go, I want the resources to pass to the next group. And one of the things that I've been astonished by is we have a number of members who carry on. Their families have passed, but they stay on the listserv. And every now and then pop up and offer little tips, especially through COVID. Uh, we have a number who are scientists and have offered in, uh, you know, insight uh, into is it likely this was a breakthrough case of COVID or was it likely a false positive? You know, that kind of uh, detail, which has been very, very helpful. Uh, if anybody's interested, they can reach out at um, uh, medium.com slash Burke Silver. I'm in Berkeley, Burke Silver. Um, and uh, reach out to me there. Uh, there's uh, various ways to do that from there. And I'd be delighted to talk to others who are interested in putting together family councils. Yeah, uh, I, I think it's I crucial. Would, I think any kind of social bond that brings, you know, we think about what we do when we get together in a PTA or any other kind of social, you know, mothers of uh, families related to kids in Montessori school. You chit chat over coffee. You have shared interests. You may not have anything else that connects you. That's kind of really what makes it powerful because it gives you a social way to connect beyond your own business or uh, location or church groups are wonderful for this, uh, community groups. And frankly, I think the kinds of things that you're doing and building a community, now a global community of people with shared interests in dementia and caring for loved ones with dementia, I think that's uh, vitally important. Um, 
I wanted to follow up on something you said a moment ago about um, about dementia and connecting over photographs. You know, there is so much new research being done and so many new breakthroughs with respect to dementia. Um, one of the things that we've been very interested in is the subtle differences in different kinds of, of dementia that lead to different ways in which the brain is able to hold on to ideas. I've felt that a lot of what I've learned in our um, uh, memory care environment about engagements and activities to stimulate the brain and keep people talking, keep people giving them ways to express themselves is super interesting. And I think it's some of the most interesting stuff that I think you're doing as well. And, um, you know, whether it's the science specifically behind uh, re uh, recollection or reminiscence therapy or these kinds of things, I don't know a lot about those, but we're super interested in ways that these pictures can get people talking. Use your words, use whatever words work. We it's know awesome. as descendants that it's a joy to just hear their voice. And I was going to say, it's also, you know, it's not only the visual, but it's also the auditory, exactly. you know, being able to hear it and see it is yeah. uh, the benefits are you enormous. Know, as I said, my kids went to Montessori school when they were little, right through elementary, actually. And one of the things that blew us away about Montessori as we learned more about it when our kids were little was the idea of uh, mixing media, making something sensorial by combining, they use uh, sandpaper letters to teach kids their letters by rubbing your fingers, feeling the letters themselves. It helps to cement it in the brain. I do believe these fundamental principles apply as the brain has for a variety of organic reasons lost its faculties. And being able to give that, they talk a lot about uh, smell being one of the most um, uh, basest, the oldest of human brain um, capabilities, uh, even when, you know, frontal lobe reasoning starts to fade, being able to get to the smell. So sitting down, I've done this with my own mom, sitting down and talking about, you know, uh, pictures of her sister's wedding when she was 14. I happen to have a collection of those. Um, do you remember what the corsage smelled like? You know, the flowers on her wrist. Was that an orchid? Did that smell like an orchid? I'll bet those cattleyad orchids really smelled rich those days. Or was that a gardenia? You know, if you talk about it, a gardenia, someone who is a gardener knows immediately what that smells like. And that's going to bring out a conversation. Peanut uh, butter. It's, power, it's powerful. <laughs> it's very powerful. What, um, so when the family, they can go, it's, it's ponga.com. That's right. Now, um, I know you'd mentioned, you know, there's a, uh, there's a free trial for a couple of weeks for families that are interested in learning more or discovering more. But I think the, for me, one of the most interesting things is that if, if I were to sign up or, you know, you were to sign up and you invited me to, you know, explore it and look at your pictures and your collections, I can stay on there as exactly. long as I want as a guest. Exactly. Exactly. I, we don't call it a free trial. In fact, what we call it is our guest. Our guest. So sure. yeah, I can uh, come on down to Ponga.com and uh, there's a little chat bot there. She'll pop up and offer it to you or just go in there and, and ask. And um, in fact, tell them Lance sent you. <laughs> and be, I'd be delighted to invite you to one or more of our pictures as our guest. And you can stay as long as you'd like. Uh, you know, engage in a little conversation. I can even send you some pictures where you can make comments. In fact, every account that's created gets their, gets a picture in their account to um, play with as their own. And then when you decide you want to upload your own pictures, only then do you need to become a member to be able to do that. So it's to add pictures, to share pictures. That's what you need to, to be a member for. And membership is just $10 a month or $99 a year. We have occasional promotions and things like that. Um, and uh, we were very active in, or very active at Roots Tech in um, uh, at the end of February this year, family history organizations, things like that. We're also talking to a number of uh, organizations that are around those social bonds as groups. 
things like um, civil war interests or World War II veterans, uh, the children of veterans of World War II, retelling their family stories, these kinds of things. Thanks. Yeah. Yeah. That's amazing. Yeah. All those moments that are so transformative to us as human beings. And, you know, schools, um, there's a lot of them that really make that make that bell ring. That that's fascinating to me. So if if you had, you know, if somebody listening or watching this is, you know, a, a, a historical buff or a sports buff and, you know, you've established these connections with these different groups and organizations, they could go on and could they would that be a public group where they could also look at the pictures or would that so be? Let's talk, yeah, let me explain a little bit about a public and why a guest and how that works. Yeah. So we're all familiar with things like Facebook and I can have a private group in Facebook. Of course you can. And that's completely fine. And you can vet people to join and all completely fine. If you post pictures to that Facebook group, anybody in the group can download the pictures and do whatever they want with them. Um, and um, Facebook can monetize your pictures. They can monetize your group in any way they want to, et cetera, et cetera, with advertising and whatever else. From our perspective, what's yours is yours and should be remain yours in your full control. So for starters, your pictures are yours, they're not ours. So second, we don't advertise against those. We don't sell your data, we don't advertise those. It's private. So it, when you share a picture or I invite you to a picture, you do have to create an account, a guest account, a free guest account in order to view that picture. And that way you're essentially validated as the person you said you were as the person who was actually invited and not somebody who just stepped in line in front of you. So those kinds of factors make it very private to keep it that way. Also, when I've shared a picture with you and quite honestly, even on our social media or the people that I invite to pictures, they are my own real authentic pictures, um, family pictures. I don't want people repurposing those for other kinds of things, they're mine. Um, so they can't download my picture. Uh, I can upload a 50 meg image, a real beautiful high resolution image. They can't download it. You can take a screenshot. You can take a screenshot. Of, I can take a screenshot of this conversation, but they don't get the full resolution image. And that's also very important from our perspective. Also, you can never grab all of the content in a picture at once and, and walk away with it. That's an, actually another very important point. You know, a lot of people talk about digital preservation. You're scanning all of these things we talked about earlier to protect them all. You're adding these precious recordings to protect them all. From our perspective, they all become part of this digital archive that should absolutely be protected. And we are uh, veterans enough of, the, of telecom, of networking, of data formats and databases to know that when you take one format and you stuff something else into that format, you're creating a proprietary format that somebody else can't use. And quite frankly, that's a very valid, defensible business strategy. It's what Facebook does when you've put all your stuff in there you know, maybe you can't get it out, but they still have it. You know, if you you upload something to somebody else's group, you get kicked out of the group, your content still stays there. You know, it's not yours anymore. Um, so uh, from our perspective, when you upload your pictures to Ponga, we make a working copy of your file. And for our buffs are very intensely interested in, in particular area people, um, they may very well have filled those files with metadata, lots of detailed metadata. It's a very important uh, topic. And as you know, in the area of photographs. So we take your, we make a working copy and we take your original and file it away. That is protected in archival storage. Everything else we do is with the, is with the working copy. And we do things so that you can zoom in and out of it very quickly. And, and we provide a matrix that you can make selections against a very specific pixel range, all of those kinds of things. Then when you add content to a picture like words, your voice, uh, attached pictures, links to video, presentations, PDF documents, anything, um, those are not stuffed into the image. They are kept as a cross-reference. 
they are they, they there is a, a pixel pixel uh, relationship to the content to where on the image that appears. That's what's displayed and viewed and managed in a Ponga page. And that is, of course, it's a page on the web viewed in a browser that can be shared as a pointer with anybody. The people that you share it with don't get that content. They get a pointer to the URL. So if you kick them out, they're gone. They can't see it anymore. If they make an appropriate comment, you can delete it and keep it as it was. Um, and that's a real important distinction. I don't want to simplify it because I think it's fascinating, um, especially for, you know, families and their genealogy. And like I said, from the dementia aspect and the support and, you know, tools that will allow families for their loved ones dealing with dementia. It almost in some ways sounds like each picture, it's like its own wiki page. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, the, the each uh, picture can be absolutely full of content. And in that way, it could be like a wiki page. We are not trying to force every single image to source all conceivable, you know, to be a repository of all conceivable information. Some people might choose to do that with an image, which is perfectly fine. We have many different use cases and fundamentally, that it's, I think of it as almost like a spectrum of use cases from on one hand, using it as a, an absolute preservative document uh, of, uh, you know, curated document of information about that moment in time. On the other end is a momentary conversation. Hey, Mary, do you remember right here what was happening at that moment? And then she records something or adds more pictures or whatever else and basically is messing it up. It's like a scrap paper, you know, messing it up with, with details that were part of it. And that's a different use case. They're both use cases for paper, right? Um, so in that sense, one important technology choice we made is that if you upload a picture, you can upload another copy of the same image right? Multi we, that's okay. You can have many copies of a picture as you want. Uh, we don't currently give you a pointer between all of the different copies of the same image. We are looking because we're doing the face organization. We are looking at every image and we know when there are multiple copies of the same image, they might be, even be different scans of the same image. We can absolutely do that. We, we aren't currently doing that. We think that's going to be a very interesting and very useful way because oftentimes you will have multiple perspectives. I don't know about your family, but mine, there are some people we don't talk about other people with because, you know, divorce and trauma and all kinds of things that just become delicate. So, you know, there you can edit, you can curate the story you put in front of different people. That's appropriate. Sure. That's, yeah, and it might be even necessary. That's right. So one other question I had that I was just sitting here thinking about is, you know, I know um, some people who have spent, you know, years, you know, curating their family tree and all their genealogy and they'll get the, you know, primary sources, secondary sources, whether it's on one of these ancestry or, you know, uh, genealogy sites or even just the old fashioned way, you know, old paper clippings and different things. Let's say you had a member join Ponga and, you know, they are spending all this time and maybe they're the matriarch of the family and something happens to them and all that work they put in there and, but they never thought to make the daughter or a son or someone else have access to it or even maybe know about it. Is there a way that's preserved? Because if that person, you know, passes and maybe they didn't, they, yeah. you didn't know Great they question. didn't pay their yeah how yeah no it's a great question so first of all the the question of 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 genealogy and family history is it is is its own thing and and I, I obviously can't speak to those but we because of the nature of memories and our own experiences as as founders we were very very aware of this issue from the beginning uh, we are currently developing um, a service that is an adjunct to Ponga where uh, essentially we will allow you to create, um, a, to, 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 to specify a beneficiary. 
and that beneficiary will have access to your digital files in the event of your passing um, and a means to essentially uh, fund the ongoing service and support for it in the same way that actually um, some my my co-founders own family uh, in the uh, in the will and trust of his uh, now late uh, dad provided funds for scanning of the images of, of, of the family history. Um, and uh, that kind of thing we thought was a really good idea. So much so that we thought we would uh, find a, a very simple way to spare people the, the cost and time of engaging with attorneys and just set up a simple form to make that easy to do. Um, it takes a little bit of fooling around, but we agree it's a really important thing and um, can provide a, a great way to link into that. You also did bring up the point about those databases like Ancestry, MyHeritage, um, Family Search, and so on. Uh, you can connect directly from a Ponga picture directly into those databases. Now, those databases are all um, password protected in, or paywall <laughs> protected in terms of access to um, a given person, for example. But uh, anything, anything that's accessible on the web with a URL can be added into a Ponga picture. Anything that is like designed to be appear on a website we will automatically embed. So videos appear in a picture. Um, PowerPoint can appear in a picture. But um, information that's hidden behind a paywall or a sign-in wall, obviously we can't give access to that. But what we do is let you just put paste in the URL and it's linkable, it's automatically linked. So we can you click on it and it presents you with a dialog box to log in. So family search. Um, I know what my grandfather, my great grandfather's, um, you know, I ID face, uh, a family family search ID, person ID, I think it's called. I know what that ID is. I paste not the ID, but the URL that includes the link to that ID. Boom! You click on it. You want to know more about him? Here it is. So we do that already. Um, so with with that service, when when a family is listening or watching us, and some people aren't as tech savvy and they might get overwhelmed. And what would you explain to somebody who says, you know, I know how to check my email and I know how to go on Facebook. Yeah. This sounds like it might be way over my abilities. Yeah. 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 How, how would you respond to that? Well, generally speaking, um, the question, you know, we, we talk to them a little bit about what they're trying to accomplish, who they're trying to accomplish it with and for, and, um, you know, find what their level of comfort is. If they're comfortable with um, either scanning themselves or having scanned images and dealing with a digital file like a thumb drive and know how to put it into a computer and pull down the images, drag and drop them into the interface, generally that's enough. With that much skill, <laughs> we can work with them. Um, I have had to explain how to paste, so I get it. Um, and um, uh, on the other hand, they can also work with someone else who will work with them. In other words, they may very well be the sort of person that recognizes that they have stories to tell and they need to tell them. Don't perhaps feel comfortable with the technology. Go find someone. <laughs> Get that grant, you know, that grandchild probably can, can, has the skills in two seconds and can sit with them. And this becomes a really important bond. And, you know, it may be grandma that whose account it is, but it may be, a, you know, Johnny who's driving and that's completely okay. So having that kind of bond then, then helps them over those, wait a minute, I'm sorry, how, how do I get, how I wanted to put that video in? Where's that video? And Johnny can go find it and paste it in you know, that kind of thing to make that happen. We don't think that should be the barrier. There's also another way, and I did this with my own um, uh, absolutely lovely um, uh, uh, cousin, actually, my mother's cousin, my 82-year-old cousin, um, who is the last of her generation to really have the, the cognition of, of the stories to tell. And instead of asking her to drive around in Ponga, I have conversations with her on Zoom. And I show her on Zoom, show her the pictures and ask her what that was. We then record the whole session. And then I can use the recorded session 
in a unlisted, this is the easy, cheap way to do it, pop it into YouTube as an unlisted link. So it's not in Google's, in YouTube search, paste, copy that link, paste it into a Ponga picture. And it tells the bits um, and can be very powerful. I have a Ponga picture that I often use to share with guests and it's linked to a blog post that talks about the 12 kinds of content that can be added into Ponga pictures. It's a great example um, to do that kind of thing. Did you want to show it or? Well, if you've got a minute, I'd be okay, delighted. Sure. Uploading pictures to Ponga is as easy as drag and drop. Once your pictures are in the software, a simple gallery walk lets you quickly and easily add names to faces. Here you can see how adding names in the Ponga gallery applies labels to each person's face in a picture. When I tap on a selection, the sidebar opens and I can see a close-up of that picture and any other content that's been added. Ponga pictures can include any kind of content, including direct voice recordings, attached images, links to public sites like Ancestry or MyHeritage, uh, PDF documents here, a family album, or recordings of media on SoundCloud and YouTube. A really fun thing to do is to be able to zoom in on the details in an image. Like this brooch that she's wearing, it turns out to be a cameo in my own family collection. Once you get the hang of it, you could use Ponga to co make connections between images, like turning pages in an album. We often introduce people to Ponga by inviting them to be our guests to explore this picture. In the description up at the top, you'll see a link to a blog post that describes the 12 kinds of content that can be added to a Ponga picture. The post at tips.ponga.com even includes a form. You can fill in your email address and ask for an invitation. You can also go to ponga.com slash invite me. To learn more about Ponga, come visit us at ponga.com. We'd be delighted to chat with you in the little chat bot on the side. Just reach out anytime. Thanks so much. I think this is fascinating. I'm, I'm very big on, you know, capturing these moments and what we may remember today from photos we've taken recently, we may not have the ability to remember 20, 30, 40 years from now and capturing those memories and the details for future generations is I think crucial. You know, that's our history. That's our family's history. You know, and I think this California. is a great, here in California, we lived through uh, over a two year period, this terrible fire, the 1991 fire in the East Bay Hills um, that raised 1400 homes. Um, and uh, two years previous, we went through the Loma Prieta earthquake that devastated chunks of San Francisco, our bridges, many homes, freeway flattened. And you think about really that's very recent history, at least in my view, and the people who were capturing ordinary day-to-day -day routine pictures for which these kinds of things were in the background, you didn't know it was an important thing. It didn't really matter. But in context of what was happening historically at that moment, it's like this building that's fallen in Miami. Oh, it's horrible. You know, you know, yeah. these, these are the things that you don't know what's going to happen. You don't know what's happening right now. And history is happening every day right now. Yeah. And these are, these treasures, are treasures in context, in context perhaps, perhaps 100, 100 years, years from, from now, now or in context yeah. next week. You don't know. Absolutely. I, I'm going to put the show notes um, with your links and information. And I'll ask you to send us some links to photos for listeners and viewers to look at and encourage everybody to um, go and take a tour of Ponga. I think it's fascinating oh, and yeah. <laughs> absolutely critically important to, you know, preserve those memories and that history. And uh, Barbara, I just can't thank you enough for taking the time to visit with us today and sharing about Ponga and the importance of having a family council. If you have loved ones in facilities, i uh, very big advocate for that. And um, we will uh, talk to you again soon and we'll have you on again and we'll do a demonstration. I'd love that. I'd love that. Thank right. you thank so you much. So much. Oh, Take care thank now. You. It's a privilege. Thank you. Thank you for joining us today at All Home Care Matters. All Home Care Matters is here for you and to help families as they navigate these long-term care issues. We invite you to please visit us at allhomecarematters.com where there's a private, secure, fillable form where you can give us feedback, show ideas, or if you have questions. Every form is read and responded to. 
We also want to offer our thanks to Barbara Tian, the co-founder of Ponga, for taking time out to share Ponga with us. Remember, you can follow the show on your favorite podcast streaming platforms and watch the show on our YouTube channel. Just make sure to hit that subscribe button so that you'll never miss an episode. Please join us next time on All Home Care Matters, where we will be discussing knowing the warning signs of stress in seniors. Thank you so much. Thank you for joining us today. We look forward to you joining us again on another episode of All Home Care Matters. To learn more about the show and to connect with us, visit us at allhomecarematters.com.